this event is uh, building integrated solar technology, pivotal solution to enhance energy efficiency. Uh, my name is Parik Lali, and I'll be moderating the meeting. Um, I'm joined by Vanessa from Mitrix, and Vanessa will be playing a, a video, uh, which includes an introduction because Mitrix is also the sponsor for this event. At the end of the uh, video, uh, the speakers in the video, Daniel, Travis, and Costa will be available to take some questions. However, in the meantime, put your questions in the chat box. Vanessa will be monitoring them and she will be able to respond to some of those questions. So without further ado, Vanessa, if you can load up the video, this should take about 10 seconds. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for attending the 43rd CSC Building Expo. My name is Emily Reese, and I am proud to introduce you to this next seminar, Building Integrated Solar Technology, the pivotal solution to enhancing building efficiency. In this seminar, you will hear from Daniel Harizadeh, Travis Yao, and Costa Katsis. Daniel Harizadeh is the founder and CEO of Mitrix. With a Bachelor of Science in Engineering, a Master's in Business from Harvard, and over 20 years of experience in the construction industry, Daniel and his team are passionate about and dedicated to creating a cleaner, more sustainable world by integrating solar technology into everything around us. While some may dream of a future where everything can generate solar electricity, Daniel and his team are making it a reality. Travis Yao holds a Master's of Science in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Waterloo, where he investigated engineering photovoltaic technologies and is a lead engineer on the research and development team at Mitrix. And finally, Costa Katsis is an assistant professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Waterloo where he is an expert in building integrated photovoltaics and is both influencing and leading the movement towards this mass adoption. I hope you enjoyed this seminar about the rising innovations in BIPV. Thank you. Hi, my name is Daniel Hadizad. I'm the CEO of Mitrix. Mitrix is an integrated photovoltaic system mainly focused on building integration as well as other products. With over 40% of gas emissions globally coming from transportation and building, we made it our mission to come up with products, develop, design, and mass produce products that they can reverse these numbers and bring us back to the levels that are sustainable. The 40% comes from mostly vehicles, transportation, and generally the buildings that we have. We divided our attention into two segments. And this is our why. This is the reason behind everything that we do. If we can transform the buildings from non-sustainable to sustainable and green energy buildings, both for retrofit and new ones, we have a chance to reverse this action. We have a chance to reverse the climate change and go back to the sustainable levels. As we speak, there is a complete frozen state of Texas. They are not connected to any other state. They are an energy island, and the hurricanes and the cold weather and the climate change is actually costing them their lives, their businesses, and the whole state is frozen. These are all signs of climate change. This is not weather, this is a climate change. Five years ago, Ted Cruz, he tweeted that he will believe into climate change if the state of Texas freezes over. Well, there you go, Mr. Cruz, it's all frozen. And this is the time to believe into scientists. One of the things we learned also during the pandemic that we are going through is if we do not believe in science, if we do not follow science, there is not much hope for humanity to, to exist. We cannot fix everything with money. We cannot print money and we cannot just create a stock markets and just looking at finance and lawyers to fix us. This is a something that needs real action. It needs real product. It needs a real change. This is not something to be fixed by agreement and contract. This is something that we have to change the way we are doing it. If Einstein said doing the same thing and expecting different results is insanity, then this is, this is the time not to be insane. We have been driving the same cars for the past 100 years. We have been building the houses and structures the same way for the past 100 years. If we do not change it, we will end up paying for it with our children and grandchildren and they will not be able to enjoy Earth as we did for the past thousands of years. 
at Mitrix, we have a triangle. This triangle will we'll use this triangle as our glasses. This is our point of view to the world around us. This triangle has a top. How much does it cost? It has the side. How does it look? And it has the next side. How much can we produce? How fast can we produce it? Once the triangle is completed, then we call it a matrix product and we can launch it. In order for the product to achieve all these three segments, especially the cost, the delivery, and the look, it has to be integration. Matrix and integration are equal weight when it comes to explaining what matrix is. Matrix is an integrated solar photovoltaic system. The integration is the key because once we integrate a product, you're creating a model that can have negative dollar per watt. What it means is if we were to spend $100,000 on a windows of a building, but right now we spend the same $100,000, and receiving $2,000 a month on the energy, all of a sudden, we did not invest into the solar, but we are also receiving $2,000 for it. I'm just giving you one example of a simple calculation. How can we achieve it? How can we have the product that, is, that has millions of dollars of R&D and the technology embedded in it, but it costs the same? And that's the art of Mitrix. That's what we created. And that's a business model that makes sense for the customer, for us, and the world. At Mitrix, when we design our products, we are making sure that every single person involved in the design of the product, the users of the product, and the future of the product, they're all connected together. When it comes to be designing any building product, the first step is the architect. We have to make sure from the architecture point of view and the architects who are going to use the product, they are not facing limitations. That's why our cladding material we have spent numerous years and several years of R&D to make sure we can have majority of the sizes required. And it's a flexible sizing, just like any other construction product. Uh, it, when it comes to design, color, texture, we have unlimited designs, colors, and textures that can be applied, which is very rare when it comes to traditional and conventional construction material. At the same time, by investing heavily into production line, that allow us to produce thousands of square feet per day. As a matter of fact, we can turn around a typical high-rise building in three to four days for production of the material. Our business model is consists of two major segments. Number one, DPA. If there is any project that requires a direct purchase of our product, we are willing to sell the product at a very reasonable price so they can utilize it into their systems and to their building. Strategy number two and the system number two for us is to stay a partner with the building and have a power purchase agreement to lower the upfront cost even lower. And we finance it internally. This is not something that's financed by anyone else. This is part of our business model. And we sell these products, we install the product, and we stay with the building for the next 30 years. The energy that's being generated by, the, by our product being sold back to the building with the agreements in place it's being sold lower than market price, typically 20, 25% below market price, just to make sure the clients are enjoying green renewable energy, as well as a lower cost throughout the next 30 years for them. In our turnkey service, we make sure that the client, they receive a full turnkey service from Mitrix. That includes permits, wiring, installation, brackets, solar panels, which are all being produced under one roof in our vertically integrated factory in Etobicoke, Ontario. Our goal is to create the world's largest microgrid company in the world. And that goal can only have three winners, the consumers, the earth, and us. We don't want anyone to lose in any aspect of the deal into this transaction, from the cost view, from the global sustainability point of view, from the installation, Everything is done in a manner that everyone is winning. And at the end, the only thing that we are receiving, if you look at it from outside, is energy that we are getting from the sun. That's what's the only free item within our scope. That's what's making our business model make sense. It's the sun. And as long as the sun rises every morning, we can keep doing this business and we can keep turning the wheel until we get to a point that we live in a society, we live in, on a planet that's all renewable energy all being recycled and the carbon embodied in the material is at the lowest possible level. One of the difficulties of innovation and innovating new product in construction industry is implementation. It might be a great product in a lab or in a production line, but it has to be implemented into a building. 
In order to do that, a lot of products, they fail in between because they don't have the proper integration or the API to connect themselves to the building. At Mitrix, we look at this puzzle in front of us, which is the construction world, and we see the missing puzzle. All of our products, they have the outline of that missing puzzle, so we don't need to change anything in our building. The architects, they don't need to change anything. The builders, they don't need to deal with new difficulties or complications. Anyone on site, they don't need to deal with anything new. It's all on us and how we integrate them already in our production line. When the product arrives on site, everything is done. It comes as one single module which has integrated solar and it's ready for installation by our certified and trained installers on site. We look at this puzzle, we shape our shape according to the missing piece of this puzzle and we just plug it in. Once we plug that in, the building is complete, the construction is complete, the architecture is complete, and it's all embedded into our system. And that's the technology of Mitrix. One of the ways that we look at our product line and we look at how do we achieve the next level is by looking at nature. We have two trees in front of our office, and every time I look at them, I can see the leaves on these trees, especially in the springtime. And it's always amazing to me that these trees, they are producing everything internally. The leaves, the roots, and everything is integrated. You don't see a tree with a source of energy like a solar farm next to it to produce energy. It's all integrated into the leaves. They use the sunlight, they break the CO2, they use the oxygen, they send out the oxygen, and they use the carbon to create the body. If you have a plant and you're looking at your plant, you just have to water your plant and give it enough sun. The soil is not being transformed into the fruits and to the leaves and to the body of the plant. It's the carbon. Basically, the trees are growing out of thin air. Once we have a tree or we have a plant, every time we are looking at those leaves, they're basically, they came out of thin air. They didn't come from the soil or the sun. They use the energy of the sun to break the CO2 and create this fruit or anything else that we can consume. That's the beauty of nature. Our buildings should be the same. Our buildings should be self-sustainable. They should be completely integrated and we do not need to have a power line or the grid down the road in the future that's going to send the energy to our building and create pollution somewhere else. This should be all integrated, self-sustainable, and that's our goal in Mitrix. Our goal is really to create a building that's as good as a tree, that's as efficient as a tree. The future of Mitrix is actually getting more clear to us. We can see the future. Now, we have products that are for military application, we have products that are for building integration. We are working on products that are for infrastructure, roads, and the future of Mitrix is actually clear. Mitrix is going to be the world's largest microgrid energy company with variety of products that are being integrated into different market segments. One of the goals that we have is to lower the cost of all these products. As I said in the beginning, we are looking at a triangle. How do we lower the cost? How do we make them look better? And how do we produce them faster? These three goes hand in hand, our fully automated lines. We have done our factory number one. We are working on factory number two to design and implement in the coming months. And our goal is to have fully automated lines to lower the cost and at the same time produce more product. These products, the more we produce them, the more positive effect we have on the global warming. This is the opposite of precast panels and aluminums. As we produce more precast panel, we have actually worsened the global warming. We are not helping it, we are making it worse. Our system is in the reverse. Not only we have lower carbon embodied, but also we have the negative carbon in the future. We are taking away the carbon. In the building industry, in the BIPV, our goal is not to sell products. Our ultimate goal is to basically deliver the product for free or close to free, install it on a building, and we just get paid from the energy. If the windows on a building are costing hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars or the cladding costing millions of dollars, our goal is to be able to do them at a much lower cost, close to zero, and that's what we call it product as a service or energy as a service, because our goal is to produce more renewable energy. And by doing so, we can have buildings that are completely off-grid, we are doing buildings that are completely renewable energy, source of renewable energy, and these are the buildings that will transform the way we live. In Canada, we have a goal to reach a net zero emission by 2050. At the same time, we have a goal to plant 2 billion trees by 2050. The only way we can achieve these numbers is 
electrification of our cars, which already started and a lot of great companies are working on it. But on the building industry side, the only way we can achieve it is number one, change the regulation. When it comes to building new structures and new buildings, there should be new regulation. They should have enough power for the charging stations for those cars. And at the same time, the building itself should be a lot more improved when it comes to energy efficiency, when it comes to energy generation, and when it comes to gener energy distribution. From our point of view, microgrid is the solution. We don't need to put more push on our existing and failing power grid. We don't want to experience what Texas is experiencing you know, in the next few years. Microgrid would eliminate all those issues. Microgrid will allow the buildings to generate their own energy, use it for charging the cars or the HVAC system, heating, cooling system, or the lighting system. And by doing that, we can access the retrofit market. The retrofit market is what's going to change the way things have been done in Canada. It's uh, the first stage that government of Canada should engage in. Retrofitting the old buildings will reach that net zero emission goal by 2050. At the same time, as a simple example, if we do 50 buildings a year for the next 30 years, we don't need to plant 2 billion trees. That's equivalent of 5 billion trees planted. That's a lot more than the goal and the target. And that's not just stopping the emissions, that's reversing the emissions. That's what we are looking for. We are not looking just to stop. This is a time to reverse. If we do not take the carbon out of the air, if we do not use the products with lower carbon embodied, then we are basically going back to square one. If we continue with the same pace, there is no hope. The hope is how to reverse these emissions and how to go back. There are areas in the sustainability that they have gotten the least amount of attention. We are all looking at cars because we can see the smoke coming out of them. We are looking at airplanes because we can see the smoke lines in the air. But when we turn around, there are billions of cubic meters of concrete being poured every year. And concrete has one of the highest carbon embodied product. It's heavy. It's difficult to move. Every time we move them, we are producing more carbon. The production of the concrete also emits a lot of carbon. So in order to avoid that, we have to come up with products with a lower amount of embodied carbon in them. If you're looking at Earth, you know, if the aliens are looking at us from outside, they will see that you know, we are going to Middle East or we are going to other part of the world to, you know, to Gulf of Mexico or Texas. We're drilling, we're going down, we're getting the oil, we are refining it and turning it into the gas. We bring it to our cars, we burn it, and then you're just creating more CO and CO2s and other uh, you know, gases that are not healthy and they're harmful for our planet. And I'm sure if they're seeing that, they're laughing at us. It doesn't make any sense. We have the sun shining at us every day, and yet we go to other areas and create this pollution. All we have to do is just to stop for a second, look at what we are doing, and think about it. I mean. When you do something different, in the beginning, everyone is kind of opposing it and they are laughing at it or they think it's wrong and, and this is not the way their fathers have done it, but that's not the way the world has evolved and that's not why we have got to here. If we're always going to look back and repeat what we are doing in the past, then nothing will ever change. This is the time to change. This is the time to stop, think, and evaluate one more time. Why not use the new materials? What's wrong with them? Is it the cost? Is it the complexity of the installation? Is it the way they look? If there are products that they have answered all of the above, there is no reason not to integrate them and not to use them on a mass scale. Change is hard, and that's what we need right now. If we, if we think this is hard, then we have to wait and see in the next 20, 30 years. That's a real life difficulty. Right now, the difficulty is just changing the mindset, just looking at things one more time. In 20, 30, 40 years, the difficulty is where do we get food? Where are the next massive hurricanes coming from? There will be hurricanes that's going to take over cities and destroy cities after cities. And those are not things that we want our kids to, to be part of. Kids that are born today, they will be in their 50s and 60s, and there will be nothing left on this planet. We all pretend and we all try to say, you know what, this is going to turn around. Someone will fix it. Someone else will fix it. Just like the pandemic, no one is going to fix it. If we don't do it, no one's going to do it. We all had to put masks. We all had to sit home. We all had to quarantine. That was a duty for all of us. Global warming is the same thing. We all have to participate. It doesn't matter 
what our jobs are. It doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter how much money we have. It doesn't matter. Those are all irrelevant because once the change comes, it's going to take everyone the same, just like the pandemic. It's going to treat us all the same. People who are running businesses, people who are building, people who are living in those buildings, it really doesn't make a difference who we are and where we are. And this is a responsibility not just for one, this is a responsibility for all. We are doing our part. We think this is our best solution. This is what we could come up with. This is the best we could do. This is where we could spend hundreds of millions of dollars for R&D, testing, and coming up with products. But I'm sure there are a lot of other good ideas. And we are here to collaborate. We are not here to compete. We are not here to block everyone else from getting into market. We have, we have had requests from other companies into the PV market to help them with installation, to help them with design services, to help them with certificates. We do that. We still do it, and we want to do it more in the future. Our goal is to accelerate this adaptation, and we keep going at it until we have secured a better future for our kids. All the buildings that are built before 1990s, they are not ready for EV. We have thousands of buildings in every city in Canada, US, and around the world. Millions of these buildings are not ready for the EV market. One of the solutions we have at Mitrix is the retrofit option. In our retrofit option, as soon as they retrofit the exterior of the building, sometimes after 30, 40 years, these buildings, they require a retrofit, and that's when we can step in. The cladding and the windows, they can be retrofitted into a solar application, all of a sudden, we have these microgrid, the small type of grid buildings that they can actually charge EV cars now. Car, uh, buildings that are designed in the 1970s, now they are able to charge the electric vehicles without taking anything from the grid. This is all sustainable within the building. Our way of looking at this solution have gone through rigorous testing and making sure that these options are available and they are affordable. So, this is one of the other advantages of using Matrix on retrofit, is to transform the buildings. Some of the provinces in Canada, such as BC, they already have implemented the new regulations that every single building that's going for permit, it has to be wired for electric chargers and electric vehicles. And that's something we need to see. We need to see that change, not just for one or two provinces or city. This has to be implemented everywhere. Anyone who's gonna build a new building, they should implement the wiring infrastructure within the building. And as soon as people are adopting to new EV, this will accelerate the adaptation even faster. If we wanna see a better future, we have to make sure this integration is done, that we can use electric vehicles that are using renewable energy, which is, the, which is generated from the building itself. Microgrid, DC power buildings are the future of the building and construction. One of the areas that we are entering in the next few weeks and releasing our product is solar panel for houses. We have designed and developed these solar panels that they can blend in with the existing roof structure. They can be installed using the same brackets and they are basically frameless. Same wiring, same inverter, without the frame and they also look like shingles and they also look like slate and any other face of the roof that exists on that structure. That's our way of looking at housing market. Our target is mostly on bigger structures and high-rise buildings, but we are releasing products in other market segments to hopefully have a bigger impact on the global warming and reducing the cost of electricity and energy for the residential market. At Matrix, our mission is to accelerate the adaptation of energy generating buildings that are integrated into all human-made structures. Rapid, low-cost, sustainable manufacturing is achievable, is here, and it's real, and it's our way to the future. Hello, my name is Travis, and I lead the R&D team here at Mitrex. Today, I'm going to be discussing the future of solar and how this plays into our company. Really, the questions that R&D team asks ourselves every single day is, what is stopping solar adoption? Where can we put solar? How can we make it better? And what functionality can we add? We want to make solar accessible for everyone. To start, I want to talk about how solar works. Light contains photons which carry energy proportional to its wavelength. When light strikes this material, the material will absorb this energy and emit something. If there's enough energy, the electrons will escape. This energy can be harnessed 
and convert it into electricity, which we can use. Every material is photoelectric. Some are just better than others. Most commonly used in the market is silicon. Really, light enters through the layers and hits the silicon, creating an electron in a hole. The electron travels through a circuit to create a current. Additional layers are added to help drive the electrons in the holes to the respective locations. This helps generate power. There's additional coatings to help the light enter the cell and additional coatings to help protect the cell from harmful degradation. In this chart, you can see the cell efficiencies amongst laboratories published by NREL, which is the National Renewable Energy Lab based in America. Here, different laboratories submit their technology, their efficiency, and then this is tested and then published for everyone to rate. Here we can see what different laboratories are researching for cells. These cells are all typically in a very small scale, you know, one centimeter by one centimeter in size. Um, but this is really the leading technology published by NREL, the National Renewable Energy Lab based in America. In purple, you can see the multi-junction cells. These have multiple active layers to convert more of the spectrum. Any light that the silicon misses is picked up by another layer, or you can convert more light into energy. Although these are typically much more expensive to do. The most common technology is crystalline silicon, which is highlighted in blue. And this is what 90% of solar technology is made of. Thin film technologies are the second generation in green. And these are emerging technologies that haven't quite made its foot in the marketplace. They require a lot less material to produce. The production is a lot more streamlined, but their chemistry is a bit more complex, making them a little more challenging to get right. Because of this, they suffer from lower efficiencies and are prone to more degradation, which means that there is a lot more strict healing process to prevent to protect it from oxygen, humidity, moisture, etc. The final generation is the third generation in orange. These are emerging technologies really only seen in the lab, but the most interesting one is the perovskite. In the orange and yellow circle, we can see the most exciting emerging technology, the perovskite. Although not detailed in the chart, in 2009, it scored an efficiency of 3.9%. However, in 2020, it is 25.2%. This dramatic rise in efficiency has seen a lot of interest in researchers and a lot of hype in the scientific community. Here we can see the leading companies behind different technologies. This shows the progress in improving the efficiency over time in a commercial sense. It should be noted that for the emerging technologies such as perovskites, gallium, arsenide, or the hybrids, only small modules have been created. These technologies face challenges of scale, which are typically material costs and methods of production. In most cases, it is difficult to increase the size while maintaining the quality. Although perovskites have seen a dramatic growth in modules, they've only been able to make 800 to 6,500 centimeter square modules. However, this is realistically closer to 800 centimeters square. So we've discussed the different solar technologies and how solar works. Now the problem of silicon. Although the cost has dropped 400 times over the past 50 years, and it's only 18 cents per watt to make a silicon cell at this moment, unfortunately, there's limitations to this technology. Number one being the poor ability to absorb light. A silicon wafer needs to be about 100 microns thick to capture all the light. This is in comparison to other thin film technologies, which only need less than one micron. This being over 100 times thicker, you have to use rigid wafers. There's no possibility for flexible applications for crystalline silicon technology. Secondly, the photovoltaic silicon requires ultra high purity. This is 9.9999999 or 9N purity. To reach that purity, you need temperatures above 1000 degrees Celsius. And this is something that you cannot overcome without such high temperatures. These high temperatures lead to high energy costs, which is a bottleneck in the price. Finally, silicon wafers are made in ingots. These are large cylinders which come out and need to be cut into wafers. 
You may have noticed that silicon cells are all squares. These cylinders need to be cut into squares to create these cells. Because of that, there's a lot of material wasted. These cells also come in a fixed size. You take what you get. There's no room for changing things on the fly here. Here comes the next generation, the perovskites. These can be produced at room temperature and can be done by printing techniques. They're flexible, which allow for foils and films to be used. And they're also less material required, making them 200 times thinner compared to silicon. The projection is about two cents per watt for this technology, making them 10 times cheaper than silicon modules. And because it can be created as a printing method, it can be used as different sizes or custom sizes, whether you want three feet, 3.1 feet, 3.2 feet, this area can be maximized. Here we can see the University of Stanford producing this perovskite using a printing technique and see how quickly it can be done. Because of the way perovskites are made, it's also open to unique optical effects. To create a module, areas of the film are scribed to create a circuit. In the red arrows, you can see, how, you can see the path of electrons flowing. The void areas allow light to pass through. These areas can be increased in size to change your transmittance or change your transparency. These layers can also be made thinner to add an extra layer of transparency or cut into unique structures to allow light to pass through. There's an additional benefit where different layers of the cell can be changed to create different colors, such as blue, purple, red, orange, or brown. The perovskite, though, is naturally a brownish-orange color. So we have this new technology. It's lighter, it's flexible, it's cheaper. Where can we use it? Lower cost applications open up integration into cheaper materials such as roads and sidewalks. At the moment, it doesn't make sense to put a silicon cell into a road because the silicon is much more expensive. The flexible nature opens up solar textiles, which can be used in tents, sails for boats, or other flexible materials. If you're out somewhere in the wilderness and need to roll out a solar panel, you can unroll the panel. Since it doesn't need to be created on glass, and it can be created on cheaper and lighter materials such as acrylic or even a, a clear film, it can be integrated into airplanes for lightweight applications. The most exciting application, though, is space. If things can be made on demand, in space, new possibilities are opened. When you're going out there, you can't bring a lot with you. So being able to print these panels when you need energy, wherever you are, is huge in this area. There's also no moisture or oxygen in space, so you don't have to worry about that degradation for perovskites. Now that we have all this power, what can we do with it? One of the obvious applications is heated roads where we can integrate a wire into the panels or into the roads and run a current through it to melt the snow and reduce the amount of salt used. Also in remote neighborhoods where snow plows don't often go, we can heat and melt the snow. Garbage bins and vending machines can also be made smart. By integrating solar into them, we can power sensors which let the user know when it's full or when it needs to be emptied. As cities transition into smart cities, we need more technology. We need more sensors and we need more ways to track things. Smart cities with LiDAR streetlights and solar, powered by solar can be created to track when buses arrive, when streets are busy, or even when there's snow on the road that needs to be clear. Here at Metrix, we're focusing on what is stopping solar adoption. Where can we put solar? How can we make it better? And what functionalities can we add? Jeff Bezos, before he retired from Amazon, said, invention is the root of our success. We've done crazy things together and then made them normal. If you get it right a few years after a surprising invention, the new thing has become normal. People yawn and that yawn is the greatest compliment an inventors can receive. Here at Metrix, we're trying to make solar normal and we want to make it a part of everyone's life. Good afternoon. My name is Costa Capsis and I'm assistant professor at the University of Waterloo under the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Uh, today, I'm here with you to discuss on building integrated photovoltaic systems um, through a different lens, through a global lens of International Energy Agency, IA Task 15, 
which is an intergovernmental panel of 17 countries that focus on research, development, and deployment of photovoltaic uh, in buildings. Before I start, I would like to thank Mitrex for organizing the session under the CSC um, Buildings Expo 2021, and I'm looking forward to the live Q&A later today. Currently, um, buildings are responsible for more than one third of global energy use and greenhouse gas emissions. At the same time, the building sector is the fastest growing energy demand sector with an annual growth of about 2%. This creates a great opportunity and a great challenge for us globally and nationally uh, for action to mitigate climate change through the electrification and decarbonization of our buildings. Now, the first obvious step is to transform current and future buildings to net zero energy and ideally to net carbon ones. Now, net zero energy buildings are buildings that have the capability to produce as much energy as they consume in an average year from renewable energy resources. Now, the generation of uh, uh, power into the building should not only cover the consumption of the building, but ideally should also cover the consumption required from electric vehicles that will be plugged in into the buildings. Specifically in Canada, our buildings are responsible for about one quarter of uh, the secondary energy use and greenhouse gas emissions. And this is excluding any related energy use and emissions associated to the Canadian fleet of passenger vehicles that the plan is to be replaced by electric ones by 2040. These electric vehicles are going to be partly charged through our buildings. So the current climate action plan is by 2030, we're going to have net zero energy ready buildings. By 2040, 100% electric passenger vehicles and by 2050, net zero carbon buildings. Now for our buildings to meet these emerging targets, we need to revolutionize the way we're currently designing and constructing our buildings. Now this revolution extends beyond buildings to the power infrastructure where a smart grid will allow the energy transactions between power generating buildings, electric vehicles, and the utilities. When it comes to um, renewable energy generation in buildings, the first step is already taken. In the upcoming National Building Code, soon to be released, there will be a provision for photovoltaic roofs with a plan that by 2030, our building code will require all buildings to be net zero energy ready. So a first question that might come to your mind is, does solar make sense in Canada? And the answer is yes. Southern Canada tends to be sunnier than Germany, which is in many cases, uh, one of the global solar leaders. Now, of course, the sunniest place in Canada are the Canadian Prairies, Calgary, Edmonton, Winnipeg, um, also uh, Quebec City uh, and Windsor Corridor, including Montreal, Toronto, and Ottawa. Now, since 2010, um, Canada has increased its uh, solar power capacity by 11 times, and nearly half of that is being installed in um, Ontario here represented with the orange bars. Uh, at the same time, the price of photovoltaic systems, and that is everything, including components, materials, labors, licensing, has been reduced by 80%. So when it comes to uh, design and construction of buildings, in many cases, it makes financially sense to incorporate photovoltaic technologies. Now, there are two ways to do this. You can either integrate photovoltaics aesthetically and functionally uh, into your building, uh, also known as building integrated photovoltaics or BAPV, or you can add it on top of your existing building envelope. For the case of a BAPV system, suddenly your photovoltaic system provides additional functions than just generating electricity for your building. Uh, it can be your primary weather barrier. It could provide shading, daylighting if it's your windows, um, thermal insulation if it's part of your um, uh, rain screen or curtain wall spandrel. Um, it could, if designed properly, can provide a noise protection as a noise barrier, um, fire protection, but also 
adds into the aesthetics of your building. While in the second case, where you just have a photovoltaic system added on top of your existing envelope, then in this case, your system has only a single function, and that serving function is to generate electricity. Therefore, if you um, apply BIPV into your building, then you can tackle several challenges with one technological solution. So here you see a conceptual design of a BIPV uh, curtain wall system for a typical um, office building, where suddenly the different parts of your curtain wall are not only there to generate electricity and supply your building with solar electricity, but also have additional functions. They're reducing your solar heat gains and therefore impacting electric lighting, heating and cooling. If they're designed properly, they can impact positively the energy consumption of your building. It also has impact in visual and thermal comfort of your occupants. Therefore, it is key to understand as designers that when we're bringing that disruptive new technology called BIPV into our buildings, we have to rethink and re, um, set the way we're designing and incorporating these technologies in our buildings. After more than three decades of research and development, finally, BAPV is a mature building material. Um, now, BAPV can be used to cover virtually uh, any surface of your building that has access to direct sunlight. Um, we have advanced technologically, so BAPV solutions right now can come in any color, shape, and texture. However, as any other building material, customization impacts module prices. So if BAPV is a mature material, why we don't see it more often and still remains a niche market? Depending on the country and the market, there are different reasons that we haven't seen uh, BAPV taking off. Um, now, the barriers and the challenges uh, that we're going to discuss um, are focusing uh, in the Canadian market, but most of these um, challenges and barriers and how we can tackle these challenges and barriers are shared between markets and countries. So in Canada, in 2016-2018, there were two national BIPV surveys. One was conducted by the business-led National Center of Excellence Remap Network and the other one from Natural Resources Canada, uh, where the objective was to identify the primary barriers uh, for the widespread uh, adoption of BAPV. Uh, and the two surveys reached out to building and solar industry professionals to ask them uh, about uh, BAPV technologies in the Canadian market. Um, so when they were asked, the BAPV professionals, if they're interested to use these technologies in future building constructions, 98% uh, of the professionals stated that they were somewhat interested to incorporate this new technology into their buildings. So this is a first simple indicator that the Canadian building market is ready to adopt BAPV. Now, the reasons why uh, professionals will incorporate BAPV into their buildings could be different. Could be just because they want to make a green statement or a statement of um, technological innovation or maybe corporate social uh, responsibility profile. Um, in some other cases, there are more practical reasons such as the return on investment uh, from electricity generation or it could be financial incentives associated to um, electricity generation from renewables on buildings. Interestingly enough, when the professionals were asked what would be an acceptable cost of a BIPV window above that of a typical window assembly that we currently use in Canada, uh, nearly 80% of the professionals stated that they're willing to pay at least $20 per square footage additional uh, cost uh, compared to a typical window unit. That indicates that the professionals um, understand the value of this technology incorporating into their buildings. 
so if as building uh, designers and professionals we understand the value of BAPV why we don't apply them in every building that we design now there are multiple buyers that stop us from the white spread adoption of BAPV um, some of them could be the return investment or the high upfront cost now both return on investment and upfront cost are expected to reduce uh, in the upcoming years following the similar trend that any silicon based technology follows now the regulatory um, and code and standard based uh, buyers uh, there is also lack of familiarity with existing products and systems and whatever that entails uh, for the incorporation of BAPV into the standard design and construction process of a building. And of course, many professionals don't know uh, how to incorporate these technologies. They don't have guidelines on how do we integrate these technologies into our buildings. So what can we do and what has been done so far to tackle these challenges. Regarding BAPV standards, in September 2020, the first international umbrella standard, um, the IEC 6392, with focus on building integrated photovoltaics, was published. Now, this first international standard is compiling the electrotechnical and building related requirements for BAPV, and we're currently in the process to adopt fully or partially this standard also in Canada. The standard set the general requirements for five uh, typical categories of BAPV modules and systems. Um, category A and B is looking into roof integrated photovoltaics, uh, accessible or non accessible within the building. And of course, this separation has to do with safety of the occupants within the building. Category C and D is looking for vertically mounted systems. Again, the separation that takes place is for accessible or not accessible within the building. And category E is looking to external integrators such as uh, shading louvers or balcony balusters. So with this first BAPV standard, we're hoping that we set a paradigm for more BAPV standards to be developed and adopted and thus overcome the current lack of BAPV standards and regulations. In addition, there are currently um, activities under the International Energy Agency, IEA PVPS Task 15, where Canada plays a key role on developing BAPV technical guidelines, best practices, and business models. Some of the key reports that we have already published under the IEA PVPS Task 15 um, that are all reports, of course, are available for free uh, on the IA Task 15 website. Um, are the multifunctional characterization of BIPV that is looking into electrical, mechanical, fire safety, durability, and reliability um, uh, requirements for uh, BIPV modules and technologies. A technical report on color BAPV technologies and the various aesthetic solutions that currently exist in the market, but also upcoming technologies that we're expecting to see in the market. A report on business cases, successful business cases on BAPV, but also an upcoming um, BAPV technical guidebook that will be published uh, at the end of 2024 where we will lay out the best practices for different BAPV uh, applications from roofing system and case studies, successful case studies around the world, to facades, curtain walls and ray screens, but also the electrical design of a BAPV system to provide energy resiliency under extreme weather phenomena such as snowstorms, ice storms, heat waves and floods situations where your grid can shut down. Now, um, a climate resilient building is inherently an energy resilient one, able to mitigate and adapt um, to critical short and long term impacts. Now, BAPV are expected to play a key role to the transition from a centralized carbon intensive power generation to a distributed, resilient and renewable generation. Hope to see you all at our Q&A session.
Okay, that, that was a fantastic presentation. Thank you to uh, Daniel uh, and to, to actually all concerned to Costa and Travis. Um, if there are any questions uh, from the audience, um, I'm looking up here. There was one question that came, what is this life cycle of solar panels? What impacts the time? And I think an answer came from Philip said 30 plus years drop to 80% capacity after that. Um, so anyway, Daniel, thank you so much for an awesome presentation. I think the attitude of, of, of trying to bring the cost down and, and make these things as affordable as possible and also collaborating with other people is, is, a, is a fantastic attitude. So is there anybody, I have a couple of questions, but I'd like to hear if anybody in the audience would like to ask a question. Costa, I had a question with regard to perovskite. It seems to be like a game changer. Is that fair to say? Like uh, in terms of, is it, and is the technology like right here, right now, in terms of uh, cladding systems, et cetera? Or is Daniel, if you're there, if you can respond. Uh, hi, uh, Travis here. Perovskites are still probably about five years away. Okay. Um, it's coming, but we're not quite there yet. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry, Travis. Thank you. The other question was regarding that. Yeah, at the end, uh, sorry, Cost was talking about standards. Um, so that'd be a question in terms of obviously it's you're producing electricity. So the, the safety measures are in place. Are they for, for uh, in case of, you know, fire or something like in a building? Is that something you could speak to? Yeah, so there are some testing requirement on any building cladding or any high rise cladding that uh, we have those certificates that are testing for US and Canada, they're different. And we do have those testing and requirements. Okay, great. A uh, question here again from, uh, from uh, Oscar. He said, what is the area panel rating efficiency of the system? So the typical panels that we have, they are 22% efficiency, just like any other solar panels. And depends on the design and the position, the efficiency could change, but the, it's the production and the output that's changing. The efficiency stays the same at 22%. And it depends on the color and option. We have a calculator on our website that uh, we can actually play around and test different efficiencies and outputs. Okay, brilliant. Uh, another question, will there be another solar technology product release for Mitrex? Yeah. Or what will be another solar technology product release? So, as, it, as I understand it, like there's obviously the cladding technology and then then for 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 uh, balcony or glazing type applications. Is that right or am I right? Am so I we wrong? are working on yeah, two aspects. One is different applications such as uh, windows and uh, roads and some other applications that we are working on. And the other one is working on different solar technologies. That would be a research phase and it's taking longer, a few more years. but. This year, we are releasing five or six other applications and products just in 2021. Okay. Um, uh, any, any questions from the audience? Stan, you always have tons of questions. <laughs> I just noticed your picture up there. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, the one thing that I, I continue to find uh, difficult is the, and I hate to use this term, but it's the fastest way, the ROI, the return on investment, depending on who your client is for this kind of technology, it's awfully difficult to um, get an agreement that it's the right thing to do. And I'm just wondering if um, any of our presenters have any sort of compelling data sheets that, that you know, the engineering and consulting community could use to get by that hurdle. We actually do have an Excel sheet that we can use for the calculations. Uh, we can take a typical building, let's say they are going to spend $2 million on the cladding with the precast. The same look, same application would be one and a half million with Mitrex with the power purchase agreement. So we are not asking the customers to invest. And since they are not investing, there is no ROI. There is no return on investment because there is no investment. Now, if they decide to buy the whole system, they are looking at 300% return on investment in 30 years. They do